Welcome back from the ad break. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much to Liberty once again for sponsoring the show. And if you haven't done it yet, please do download the Tenfold Education app and you can send through all your questions. So in today's show, all the questions that you're seeing come from the Tenfold Education app. Thank you so much for sending your questions. I can really, really see that you guys are really working hard. I can really see all the questions that are streaming through. And yes, I am right here over here to help you get a level seven. So before the ad break, we were doing paper number one, which was physical sciences. Now in the second one, we were able to find a one from Steve Lee, which is from paper number two, and and it's chemistry. Now, chemistry and physics, I can say you have to have a bit of a mind shift, right? Where physics is formulas and applications and you need to think about things. You need to see the bike going up the ramp and think, yeah, going up an incline, I'm gonna need a bit more force. I must cover certain distance and all that stuff. Whereas with chemistry, you need a lot of theory behind everything, right? There's also a lot of conversions. And if something is like this, it's because of this. So what I'm telling you about chemistry, you need to sit down and read. Read your chemistry textbook like, like a novel, right? Read about acids and bases. You must read about all the theories that come with acids and bases. That is the only way you're going to master it. Adding on to that, if they're telling you a learner puts so much volume in a beaker and then they titrate it with so much of this, I would say draw yourself a picture because in physics and chemistry, if you can see it, you understand it. Sometimes it gets quite a bit challenging if you have to think about everything from your mind and you're not actually seeing what's going on. Draw yourself a picture, draw yourself that learner that is actually mixing all these things and it does make it simple. But remember, for chemistry and for understanding paper two, you need to know your theory. Remember, in physics, they give you all the formulas and it's easy to just work from that. In chemistry, you must know what you're talking about because there's a lot of explain and give a reason why and elaborate your answer. So you get marks for elaborating and referring back to theory, referring back to theory the whole time. You are then showing the examiner that you know how to link a certain concept with a certain understanding and then coming to a certain conclusion. So without wasting time, let's look at this question. This was question number seven, and it's talking about Ka. The minute you see this, think acids and bases. The Ka value for two weak acids, which is oxalic acid and carbonic acid, are as follows. Now, already, when you're talking about weak acids, you need to know what or where they come from. When we talk about acids and bases, I want to take you back to grade 11. We learned about the Lowry Browns, that we learned about the Lewis and all that stuff. And these theorists were talking about weak acids and strong acids. And somehow some acids actually ionize or dissociate completely, whereas others don't. When we talk about weak acids and when we talk about strong acids, we have to also bring in the different types of indicators that we can use. Now remember, in physics or in chemistry rather, you don't just use an indicator. You must either know, is it a strong base with a strong acid? Is it a strong acid and a strong base? And I, must I use bromothalmol blue, methyl orange, phenylephthalene, and so forth? So depending on the weak and the strong, we are able to learn from that. So already in your mind, you must have all these things running, as well as the names that you are given. Now, taking it back from organic chemistry, carbonic acid, that was pretty easy. But some of these words can be quite challenging. So you need to familiarize yourselves on which question papers do they actually have? How do they ask the acids? How do you see the acids? And things like that. Remember, according to the acids and bases theorists, they either will donate or they will either accept. But if you do not know which one is the acid and which one is the base, then you would not know what is going on. So that's a little bit of theory. So we are given those weak acids, you need to know that. So we've got oxalic acid and carbonic acid, and they are as follows. These are the formulas that were given. This question paper, the examiner was pretty friendly. Now we are given the Ka value. Here we've got 5.6, I think that's times 10 to the negative 2 on that one. This is 4.3 times 10 to the negative 7. Now remember, when we talk about the Ka value, it tells us the strength of the acid. The higher the Ka value, the stronger the acid that it is. When you talk about the Ka value, I want to take you back when we talk about Le Chatelier and you have to calculate the Kc. So it's basically more or less on the same level. You need to know what does it mean when my Ka value is low and what does it mean when my Ka value is high. In this case, a low Ka value means weak and a strong one means then it is a strong acid. The first one says define the term weak acid, that is for two marks. Remember, when you are defining something, you're not explaining to the examiner what's going on. You have to give a definition that will never change and that will remain the same. So if I have to define it, it is a substance. A substance that ionizes. 
that ionizes completely there we are let's look at the next one and then they're going to ask us which acid oxalic acid or carbonic acid is stronger we must then give a reason. If this is for two marks, you get a reason for either saying oxalic acid or carbonic acid. You get another mark for actually giving a reason for your answer. Let's go back to our theory. Between the two, the only way I can know this is by looking at the Ka value. Remember, the higher the value indicates a strong acid. So in this case, oxalic acid will then be my strong acid because my reason will be it has a higher Ka value. Or you can even say carbonic acid is weaker because the Ka value is less. It is 4.3 times 10 to the negative 7, where oxalic acid has a higher Ka value of 5.6 times 10 to the negative 2. Now remember, if ever you have to explain something, you must use the correct physics terminology. For an example, now they're telling us we need to give a reason why the one is strong and the one is weak. Don't say because it says that so on the table. The examiner knows the table is there. The examiner knows that you can see the table is there, but the examiner wants to know that based on the information on the table, what can you then conclude? Concluding means I can say, aha, uh -huh. my theory on Ka value means the higher the Ka value, it means the stronger the acid. Therefore, oxalic acid will be the strongest. Remember to always use beautiful conjunction words so that the examiner knows what you're talking about. So with 7.2, my answer to that will be my oxalic acid. And remember, they say, give a reason. We can say it has a higher Ka value. Or you could have said, this is really not wrong. You could have said carbonic acid for your reason, right? You could have said carbonic acid. You could have said carbonic acid has a lower Ka value because now you're showing the examiner that you know that the Ka value determines the strength of an acid and so forth. 7.3. So now we are told that oxalic acid ionizes in water according to the following balanced equation. We can see something is happening here. It was a solid, liquid, aqueous solution, aqueous solution. Now they're telling us to write down the formula of the two bases, right? bases in the equation. I just want to go back here. Don't get confused. First, they tell us that the value of two weak acids. Now, all of a sudden, they tell us we have two bases. Now, I want to tell you this. Remember, in physical sciences, when you read the forward reaction and you read the reverse reaction, in acids and bases, we have what we call conjugate acid-base pairs, which means you have certain substances that when you're looking at the forward reaction, they're acting acid, acid, acid. And then we look at the reverse reaction, then they're like, base, 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 base. So now, looking at this equation, we then therefore need to see which one actually donated and then which one actually accepted. Now, remember, you're going to read it in the forward reaction and in the reverse reaction. If you are getting a little bit confused with this one, I would rather say redraw it and then ionize it completely. I'm going to do it the long way around. If you can already see it from here, good, thumbs up. But I'm going to do it for the long, in the long way around for everyone else who does not know how we're going to get it. So now remember, we are given an equation, and the equation is C, O, O, H, and there's a 2 over there, plus, and then we've got 2 H, 2 O, which is my water. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to write the phases of it, because I just want to show you how do we know if one was an acid or one was a base, plus, this becomes 2 H, 3 O plus. If you are getting confused, I want us to write a little table of theory. Remember, according to the Lowry Bronsted th theory, Lowry Bronsted, they say a base will accept an H plus, and they say that an acid will donate an H plus. Now, I want us to look at this equation. I'm going to start with this one over here. We had COOH, and then I look at the counterpart here. Aha, uh -huh. we had an H, the H lost, the H is lost on the side. So what loses an H? What will donate? It is an acid. This is an acid. I'm going to write conjugate here. Let's look at the other one. Let me just change color. I have water here, which is H2O. 
And then all of a sudden it is H3O. So what happened this one? This one then gained, it gained an H. Now I'm gonna read it reverse. The H3O plus, for it to become H2, it must lose, right, an H. Now this can also be a conjugate, but let me not confuse you with that one. But remember, if they do ask conjugate acid bases, here I've got COO, all of a sudden it has an H. What did it do? It accepted, it must have accepted one. So I'm gonna say it gains here. Now let's give it words. This is an acid. If something has gained, it must be a base. This one also gains, this must also be a base. If something lost, if something donated, it must then be an acid. So the question asks us for the two bases in the equation. Remember, you first have to read it in the forward reaction and see because what this one was and what it is there, what did it do? Did it lose or did it gain? Then you can differentiate whether it was an acid or a base. And then you read it in the reverse reaction and then say, okay, this one doesn't have an H here. All of a sudden it has an H, so it must have gained something. So the two bases in this equation, it is my H2O and it is my COO2 2 minus. Those are my two bases. Because how did I know that? I need to know my theory of acids and then bases. Let's look at the next one. 7.4 looks like a calculation. Remember, if you are struggling with calculations, draw yourself a picture. 7.4 says, learners prepare a two cubic decimeter, remember that is volume, of sodium hydroxide, that is NaOH, solution of concentration of 0.1 mole per cubic decimeter. They want us to calculate the pH of the solution. Now, you, I'm going to show you various ways of doing it, but also, if you are getting confused, always write what you are given on the side and then take it from there. We were given the volume, which is 2 cubic decimeter, which is 2 dm3. We were also given the concentration of it, which is 0 0.1. Concentration is mole per cubic decimeter. That that's what we were told. They want us to find the pH. I'm going to show you two ways of doing it. Remember, they're talking about sodium hydroxide, NaOH. That's what they are talking about. So the one way you could have looked at it is looking at the Kw of water. Remember, we know that the concentration of the OH and we have the concentration of the hydroxide, which is H3O+, plus, that is equal to the Kw of water. Kw of water is 1 times 10 to the exponent 14. Now remember, sodium hydroxide is a base. How do I know that? According to the side, to the acid base theories, if something has an OH or um, if there is an OH, then it will form as a base. So that's the concentration I'm going to use. My concentration is given to me as 0 0.1. And then I have my H3O plus. Remember, if you're looking for pH, you're looking for the H3O plus ions. So I'm going to keep this as H3O+. Now I feel like I find acids and bases, especially pH, very easy. You cannot fail this. I'm looking for H3O+. Remember, it's just mathematics, and it's mo most of the time it's very straightforward, guys. I've got 0 0.1 on this side. I'm going to divide it by 0 0.1. This and this will cancel. So the concentration of H3O+, see how easy it is. We're going to now calculate it. In your calculator, I would always put it in a, in a in brackets. I'm going to say 1 times 10 to the exponent 14. Let's close my bracket. And at the bottom, I've got a concentration of 0 0.1. And then I've got 1 times 10 to the exponent 15. I'm going to have 1 times 10 to the exponent 15. Remember, I'm not done, though. They did say pH. Now, the formula for pH... The formula for pH is negative log and the concentration of H3O+. plus. We're going to bank all these marks. We're going to say negative log. I just calculated the concentration of H3O+. plus. Let me not use solid brackets, which is 1 times 10 to the exponent 15. Let's see what we get here. I'm going to say negative log. Okay, wait, I can't find my log now. Negative log. Okay, I'm just going to tell you what I got. Negative log, so I don't waste time. 
If you put this in your calculator, you will get a 13. Now, I would always say, if you do get your final answer, and we are talking about basis, I would always say, look at your pH scale and see if your answer actually corresponds to what you were given. This is what I mean. Now we know that a base is OH and sodium hydroxide is a base. If I had to look at my pH scale, it's gonna look like this. Remember, if we have zero here, we have seven and we've got 13. Seven is a neutral, I'm just gonna write an N here. Anything towards zero is acidic, right? And anything towards 14, not 13 here, anything towards 14 means it's very, very basic. Now, if any OH is a base, it means it has to be seven or greater. So having the answer 13 means it actually corresponds with what we were then supposed to get. <clears throat> so let's continue with our question. So now we've calculated the pH there. Now 7.5 says, during a titration of the sodium hydroxide solution in question 7.4, now they're talking about titration. Now titration is also another question that you guys cannot fail. Now remember, if you're talking about titration, we're talking about having an acid, having a base. We, our acid and base must have a concentration, it must have a volume, and we must know the mole ratio of the two. When we are titrating, there's usually one unknown. It's just a lot of mathematics, but if you read your question properly, you'll then know what you're looking for and then what you're given. So let's see. During titration of the sodium hydroxide solution in question 7.4 with a dilute oxalic acid, now it's diluted. Remember, there's a big difference between diluted and then concentrated. The learners find that 25.1 cubic centimeters of the sodium hydroxide neutralizes exactly 12.2 cubic centimeters of the COOH. Now we are given a balanced equation. It's very important that you have a balanced equation for your mole ratios. Look here. For every two moles of this, I only require one mole of this to form one mole here, and I'll have two moles there. It's a ratio. Now, 7.5.1 says calculate the concentration of the oxalic acid in then the solution. I'm going to show you how we do it. And this is 7.5. So 7.5 says I've got my acid. It must have its volume all over. I must have my base. It must have a volume all over the mole ratio of acid over the mole ratio of my base. Now, I know that I'm looking for the concentration of my acid. The volume was given to me as 14.2. The concentration of my base was 0.1. Remember, that's the sodium hydroxide we just calculated. It was in a volume of 25.1, and it is in a mole ratio of 1 is to 2. Now, it's just mathematics. I've got a fraction on this side, a fraction on this side. How do I solve that? you cross multiply. Remember, you must cross multiply with any, everything. I'm gonna have 0 0.1, and I'm gonna have 25.1, everything multiply, anything multiplied by one remains itself. On this side, I'm gonna have CA, that is my unknown. I'm gonna have 14.2, multiply that by two. I need to find CA by itself. I'm gonna divide both sides by 14.2 and two, and I'm gonna do the same thing on this side. I'm gonna have 14.2 on this side, and then I'm gonna have two. Remember, this and this will give us one, that will also give us one. The concentration, if you had to work it out, you will then find a concentration of 0 0.09. Remember, always to two decimal places. The SI unit for concentration in, in chemistry is mole per cubic decimeter. There we are. Now I've tried to squeeze everything in. Let me see if I can squeeze one last question. So we've actually finished two questions. Which one of the indicators above is most suitable for the titration? Now remember, indicators is based on everything. The indicators is then phenylephthalin because it is for a weak acid and then a strong base. How did I know this? I know this from all my rules of organic chemistry. Different indicators work with different bases and different acids. Really hope you enjoyed today's show. Really hope I could help. All the best with all your studies and I will see you next week.